Hello everyone and thank you for joining our Ask the Experts technical webinar. My name is Brian Soltis and I'm the technical evangelist here at Kentico. And I'll be hosting this video as well as uh, joining in on the panelists as one of the experts. Um, this webinar is a little bit different than our other ones. This is an interactive session with a group of Kentico experts with years of experience developing with the platform and I, I've known all of these developers for a very long time and I, I can definitely say that they are experts at using the platform and they're all very good Kenko developers so I know they've done some amazing things and we'll be able to handle your questions and, and really get you some good information. Uh, before we get started I'd like to cover just a few points about the webinar. We're going to record it as usual and we'll be posting it to the Kentico YouTube channel after today. If this is your first time using GoToWebinar, you're, everyone will be in a uh, muted listen-only mode. And for this particular one, I've actually disabled the questions ability because we have so many questions already. And But more importantly, because it's interactive, um, you can ask your questions live on Twitter using the Kentico Experts hashtag, and you'll be able to ask your question live, and we'll, we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. So... Um, not too much, not too much housekeeping for the webinar today because, again, this is a little bit of an interactive one. So now I'd like to go ahead and jump into the panelists, and I'll have each one of them just introduce themselves and explain a little bit about where they work and, and what they do. So uh, the first I will come up with is uh, ladies first with Laura Fries. Please go ahead and tell us some about yourself, Laura. Um, I have been working at iMedia since 2012 and uh, been working with Kentico for a couple of years now and I love it. Um, I'm also uh, a skydiver. That's right. Laura is, I believe, our only skydiving MVP at this point, so she brings a lot of interest, interesting stories to the table. Thank you, Laura. Uh, next up will be Michael Kincaid. Hi. Um, I'm up here in Toronto. I'm the CTO at Eccentric Arts, and I've been working with Kentco for about, I think, seven or eight years now. So I think the earliest version um, I got to play with was 1.8, going back a fair bit. Wow, I will say, Michael, you may actually beat the uh, what I know as one of the record holders, which is uh, Jeroen First, who's another one of the MVPs. I believe yeah. you used 1.9, but you're the first person I ever heard say 1.8. There you go. <laughs> Uh, thanks, thanks, Michael. Uh, next up would be Roman Hutnik. All right, so uh, I'm Roman Hutnik, and I'm uh, a solution architect at this orchestra. I'm working uh, with Kenico for last, I think, six years. I'm working things version uh, 5.5, um, and I just like uh, Kenico. I like to work with this product. Excellent. And the last panelist will be uh, Ray Wang, who's, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Ray. Hi, everyone. Ray uh, here. Um, so I'm actually, I'm uh, in the U.S. office in New Hampshire. Um, I've been with Kenco for about two years now, uh, but I've been in the CMS industry for 10, over 10 years uh, previously within, uh, with another CMS uh, software company. Um, so, uh, and some of you may know me from trainings or other engagements. Uh, but definitely, you know, I will be glad to answer any questions you have today. Awesome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all the panelists joining in. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, our very first question we're going to kick things off with is going to be on the JavaScript side. So it's going to be, how do you normally include uh, your own JS files into your projects? Are you using the JavaScript web parts? Are you putting them in the template layout? Other And uh, I'll actually open this up to the whole panelists. Some of the questions I'll aim at a couple of them, but... Feel free to, to chime in um, if you if you have an opinion about this. Cool. Um, I know we've been, I think over the past couple of years, we moved to Grunt, and so now we've been using Gulp really to manage most of our JavaScript files. And that's really just so that we can run things like JS, Hint, Lint, um, Uglify, compress them together. But we still still make use of things like the, you know, the JavaScript web parts every now and again to bring in JavaScript to a specific page or pages? Okay, I, I know in my experience what I did was um, I, I actually, ironically enough, I've worked with Kentico a very long time, but I, de I develop a very small amount of front ends. I mean, I did it years ago, but most of, the, most of my development was back end. And um, I know when I did it, I actually used the JavaScript web part a good bit, but then again, I hadn't really progressed to the 
you know, the, the compilers and the, you know, the, the really advanced JavaScript stuff that you kind of mentioned. Um, I, I never got that deep into it. I guess I'm, I'm more of a back-end developer. I never got that much into the front-end aspect of things. Um, yeah, they're pretty, they play very nicely with Cantigo, so there's no issues. Excellent. Okay. Does anybody else have uh, any other kind of comments about how they implement or how they use JavaScript? Um, so, yeah, I would like to add that, uh, yeah, Canico uh, gives a lot of uh, different possibilities to include, uh, to reference your JavaScript files. Uh, you can use template hat, you can use either um, a JavaScript web part to reference file or in, um, just put in line JavaScript code. However, I would recommend to place it into a template layout and, uh, if possible, at the end of the layout markup. This is just, to me, um, it's best practice from the performance standpoint. You mean you put them like in the actual layout of the template themselves just at the bottom of it or using the JavaScript web part to force them to the end? No, ju just references like um, a strip references with no web part. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. Um, all right. Well, thanks. Those are some good answers. Um, I'm going to actually, this is, I'm going to take our first uh, Twitter question just because it came in so quickly. And that was going to be. Hey, Brian. Oh, I'm sorry, Laura. Please go ahead. I'm sorry, Laura. Please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, if I could just add in, um, I like to uh, host the JavaScript on the server. If it's something static, like a like um, a light box script or something like that, that's not going to be changed. But if it's something that's going to be changed regularly, then I like to either put it in a web part or at the bottom of a temp at the bottom of the master template, so that we can easily sync it with production. That's a that's a really good point. Being able to whatever whatever facilitates an easier migration from one environment to the other is definitely a good idea. So I, I like that idea too. Cool. Um, anybody else before we move on? Okay. So the next question is going to be, and I'm, this is going to be kind of odd. I want to put the question up here, but it, we'll see how it goes. And just why should I consider upgrading to Kentico EMS? Um, I'd like to actually get uh, Ray's opinion on this, Ray, right? because I know you have a lot of good EMS experience. What What are maybe some of the biggest points about why someone should upgrade EMS that, that you would think of? Okay. Um, so basically, uh, using Kentico EMS is uh, uh, one thing is that it's all in one system versus uh, if you use uh, uh, Kentico just for the CMS functionality and utilize uh, like a, a third party software to manage the, uh, the online marketing part, you are basically have two systems to maintain and uh, integrate and make sure you integrate them correctly as well. Um, so that's uh, the first hurdle. Uh, then, of course, with the all-in-one system, you'll be able to track all the online activities uh, and those uh, performed by the visitors, which you can start right away, uh, you know, planning out your strategies for, for like, uh, content targeting and, and also to understand your audience better. Um, and so, uh, for example, like say, you know, when a uh, visitor comes to your website, if you're using a third-party tracking tool um, for, say, like say, Alqua or Marketo, uh, you may have like uh, JavaScript uh, files on your site and all the activities will be tracked on their system. Uh, but later on, uh, when you want to do the campaign or when you want to uh, plan out some, like, AV testing or other things, where would you get the data? You have to go back to the other system. Uh, and then, you know, the campaign pages, do you have to create the campaign pages in the other system, which uh, you may have, uh, you have, you have to uh, manually bring some of the content over to the other system. And then basically all the data will be uh, outside and all the content you need for that may have to be recreated versus within Kinico, everything is tracked right there for you. Uh, you can monitor the, the activities right away, and then you can use those uh, without actually uh, rely on the IT team to, to help you that much. Um, you can simply set up like a business rules using our macros. Uh, and so you know, something like simple, say on your homepage, uh, based on the, the traffic, I want to display something a little different for, uh, for the visitors from US versus uh, uh, from Canada. You can simply set up a simple rule and then set up like two, uh, like a personal variant based on that rule. And so display co different content will be, you know, uh, you know, will be, or different content will be showed when visitors come from different regions. And then other things like uh, you know, email uh, marketing or mar uh, those 
it can be set up right away within CMS. And uh, like I said, when you try to create a newsletter, uh, you know the content. If you want to reuse some uh, some of the content that you have on the site already, you can again, uh, you know, either create a page, a dynamic page, uh, which is a web part driven, or you can create like a kind of static email. But uh, we also again have uh, 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 macros or widget that you can use in order to create or uh, to re. Uh, repurpose some of the content that you already have on the site uh, to create that email. Uh, so basically, you know, all, all in all, uh, you know, with the uh, with the one pla uh, everything in the single platform, it's easier for you to manage things and also uh, reuse this information versus uh, you know, uh, keep them in separate platform. The integration part is going to be a hurdle in a lot of cases. So if you can't tell, Ray, Ray works in EMS a lot. That's how he took all the best answers for the question. So, um, but that's okay. Um, I'll just chime in to the, to the EMS talk as well. I mean, in addition to all the great points that you said, Ray, I, I would say that EMS is just, in my opinion, it's, you know, a, a CMS is great for building a, a dynamic website that you obviously can change the information and, you know, and put up and, you know, manage your content very effectively and quickly. The EMS portion, in my opinion, allows you to understand the data within your website and how people are interacting with it, understand how a user is, is working with your content and how are they, you know, what is effective marketing to them and what is not effective. So it really allows you to, really allows you to channel your efforts and your content production and management to the most effective process possible. And that's really, I guess, the next thing I would say for the EMS is it allows you to, to really work smarter and better. So, um, so that's kind of what I'll add into that. But uh, I think that was a, that was a great kind of summary by, by Ray. I, I appreciate it. So um, moving on, this question is going to be for, um, let's, we're going we're gonna to check out, we're going to see how uh, Michael and Roman deal with this particular question. It's a little bit different, but um, I have my own opinion as well. But uh, what are some recommendations on how you would integrate over 30, let's say, .NET VB language pages in the Kentica website with the Portal Engine master page? Um, have either one of you ever dealt with that? Michael, have you ever dealt with a, another language like that and working it with Kentico? No, not in that way. I think the first suggestion I would have would be to rewrite that to C Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably the easiest answer, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Join the future. That's right. I, I will say um, I actually have. I have dealt with um, with other languages like that. And I remember, I don't, I haven't, I mean, I haven't done this in so long, but I remember like four or five years ago, I was able to use VB. Like you can blend VB and C Sharp into the same project. It is possible to do it. I don't recommend it because it obviously creates a lot of a lot of headache. But it is possible to have both languages within the same .NET project. Although, what well, I don't think that really creates a scenario that's really good. I think everything should be on the same programming language or at least the same type. And I will tell you, um, I've done development for a very long time, 16 plus years. I started out doing ASP, which is VB Script, and then I did VB.NET, and I did that for about two or three years and then I had to make the transition and I still have a book to this day that tells me VB.net to C sharp so I understand how to do a simple you know select thing I always have to go back and look at how to do a switch and things like that but once you understand one language it is pretty easy to transition your code from from VB.net to C sharp um, that that would probably be my recommendation as well as I, you could get it to work together but I would most certainly rec rewrite it and into the portal engine method using web parts um, Roman, do you have any other kind of thoughts on that? Uh, I would just like to add, so after um, Michael would convert everything to that map report, so uh, the, uh, I like uh, the thing that uh, can you call um, a placeholder? I, so you can use multiple placeholder on Canico portal page. And uh, this placeholder has, uh, uh, there is an option to specify uh, which uh, exactly page you would like this placeholder to show. So this is uh, kind of a good approach for showing um, all your, let's say, main uh, uh, main sections on the landing page of your uh, of your site. So this is you, you may add them as many as you want, and this is easy, and this is kind of a uh, great uh, substitution for iframe, which which is definitely not recommended. Um, uh, approach to use anywhere. 
So yeah, this is how you can combine multiple pages within your site on one page using just multiple placeholders. Excellent. All right, I think those are I think those are great ideas and um, and again, it, it, that's that's a difficult situation. Obviously, if you have you know thirty something pages, it may not be the easiest thing for you to just rewrite that. But um, I really think that that's your. I mean, you could have a quick fix of of just trying to get it to work within the Kensico site. But I think you're better off in the long term rewriting that, bringing it into a consistent code base across your entire application, which is going to be C sharp. So that that's um, probably the. So if there was if there was some uh, valuable business logic that you could actually wrap that up in a VB author DLL and use that in your project, but then, you know, actually make the pages and web parts that use that business logic into C-sharp, it would minimize the amount of rewriting, but... That, that's actually a good point, yeah, encapsulating in its own DLL. And actually, there I don't remember any of the name of them, but I have used a tool in the past that will actually convert VB to dot, VB.net to C-sharp, but it's, you know, it's something else is converting your code, so it's not 100%, you know, foolproof, but it does kind of do a lot of the grunt work for you. But, again, I think that would be another option is, is like you said, encapsulating its own DLL. That way you can include it in without having to rewrite it. You just may need to build a wrapper around it in order to inter interact with that API or that interface. So, all right. Um, next question we're going to go to, this is going to be for, uh, for Laura and Roman, and that's going to be, I'm just curious, and maybe I'll get Michael in here too if he's done anything wrong, but uh, what's one thing you've done in, in your past with Kentico that you really wish you hadn't had done, like, and how did you learn from it? Like, what's that one big mistake that you did? And um, if you're too shy, I can actually have my own mistake that I'm willing to, to air. <laughs> um, so how about, how about you, Laura? What, what's the one thing that, that you did? All right. Early on, when I first started working with Kentico, I didn't realize um, how how versatile it was and, and how many things it already had built into it. And so, with a lot of the features like searching and, and stuff like that, um, I went out to other sources and 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 used external um, external providers for those things, and then built a lot of uh, customizations into it. And then after um, looking more into what Kentico provided, I realized that it just it it had all those features already. So one important lesson is to uh, look in the marketplace and um, look at all of the built-in things that Kentico has before you actually start rebuilding the wheel. That's an excellent that's an excellent idea. Is definitely not not recreating something that's already there. Uh, how about you, Roman? Yeah. I would say the same customization is the uh, the most common mistake. So I'm um, right now I'm trying to keep as much as possible out of the box. And if uh, if uh, if I need some customization, I would definitely use Kenico API. Uh, so definitely no direct writes to uh, to database with entity framework or whatever else. Gotcha. I, and mine, I guess, will be a little bit more uh, more architecture speaking. So uh, uh, many years ago, I was in a room with about 10 different partners while we were working on the Kentico training uh, curriculum. And uh, I stood alone when I said that the ASP model, ASPX model was better. And I was uh, chastised and ridiculed to no end by the rest of the partners in the room. And uh, it's only because I was a .NET developer and I didn't understand the portal method, so I just naturally just did everything ASPX, which is totally fine if that's what you want to do. But once I saw the uh, the glory and the 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 wonderment that is the portal method and how much it can expedite your development, it really kind of changed the way I started developing websites, and it really made it much more efficient and, and quicker. So um, that's probably I would say is make sure you understand there's lots of different ways to do something, and you kind of have to figure out which way makes the most sense for you and your in your projects. And uh, actually, I would like to jump in here for a little bit. Uh, so this is not really like uh, from my side, but uh, uh, it's from what I have seen from uh, client cases. Um, so one of the common cases, which is kind of related to what you are just saying, Brian, uh, is that uh, uh, developers, or especially uh, uh, every organization should understand that, uh, you know, especially for marketing users, if they want to use some of the, um, the online marketing features, such as uh, you know, personalization and also A-B testing and uh, some of the other features, 
the the only way that's available right now to use them is uh, either through the portal engine method or through the mix mode method. If you're doing the hardcore ASPX way or you know, make things even worse in this situation, MVC, uh, those functions are not available. So, uh, but in the you know in the past uh, or not really past, but the, in the more recently as well, I have seen uh, quite a few cases that uh, uh, either the uh, the vendor, the client hired, or the, the client internal team didn't realize that uh, because they have hardcore developers. They simply jump in and did things uh, their old-fashioned way and then delivered the project. And then at that moment, the whole marketing team got caught off guard saying, how do I, uh, how should I do the you know, personalization or A-B testing right now? Oh. Oh, sorry, you cannot do that because it's a pure ASPX uh, website. So th these are the things that uh, you know you need to understand at the beginning. Who's the audience, or not really the audience? Who's going to be the user? Uh, is it marketing? Uh, are they going to do these things? If they are, then your design should be uh, uh, complement uh, their needs versus just uh, do your like the, the hardcore way, which uh, works easy for you, but uh, though for them, this tool becomes something that uh, no, that's not what they purchased this for. So definitely, you know, uh, understand that part before you start any development. That's a good point. Understanding what the platform supports, and and as Ray kind of said, in, in when we recreated our new MVC architecture and framework for version nine, um, we really built the foundation that we're going to continue to improve and and add functionality to. But that foundation does not support a, a few pieces of the of the platform right now, and that's going to be coming in later versions of, of Kentico is, you know, more of these EMS type of features, but understanding what is supported at that moment in time is definitely important. Um, and it becomes very important when it comes to the functionality of the website. So um, in speaking, in keeping kind of with that EMS theme, I'd like to ask Ray, um, what are, what are some of the best practices when dealing with a lot of EMS data that you can kind of give, give the crowd? I mean, what are maybe, let me, let's say the top three things they need to think about when they're dealing with a lot of EMS data. Uh, I would say the, the first thing is uh, understand, uh, or, or uh, let's uh, go through each of those uh, for context. Uh, always make sure that you have uh, the, uh, there's a setting for the save or to delete uh, inactive context. Uh, because if you don't do that, your database will just keep growing and growing. Um, but uh, make sure you have that uh, turned on. So because there are always uh, one-time uh, visitors, and uh, you know if they did something on there, it's going to be left in the database. And those uh, information are not really valuable for you after a certain period of time. So definitely you know, enable that in the settings, uh, online marketing section, to remove those uh, inactive uh, contacts um, that your you know that your database would not just uh, grow too much. And then for the activities, try to understand what you have uh, on the site and then what's, uh, uh, what are the one, uh, ones that you do care about. Um, by default, uh, again, in the settings, uh, you'll see that all kinds of activities uh, uh, performed by the visitors would be tracked. But would some of those be relevant to what you're targeting with or, you want, uh, or are you going to utilize those rules or to set up certain rules? If not, again, you can disable some of those activity trackings as well. And also, on the other hand, you can create custom activity tracking as well in case uh, there's something that you're doing is not out of box, so those can be tracked. Uh, but uh, again, yeah, understand what you have and what you want to do with them, and then track the, the ones that's uh, more important to you. And then, of course, uh, once you have those information, uh, no study them. Uh, you know, you can uh, you can actually you can sort them directly in the activities, and uh, you can. Oh, we also have a custom report module which you can use to write the custom query to uh, against the activity table to to understand what's going on within the site, uh, and then you can find out the top uh, activities that's going on, and then basically you know set up some kind of rule or to target those uh, those activities as well. Awesome. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate that. And I really think it's going back to the kind of the best ideas is it's really understand that once you turn on EMS, you're going to start getting a lot of data. So you really need to make sure you're doing as much housekeeping on that data as possible, which is what you kind of recommend with most of your stuff. So, um, all right. Our next question is this one's going to be for, uh, let's go with Michael, Roman, and Laura. So, Michael, what is your best People don't forget to check this setting and configuration tip when it comes to Kentico. Your number one that you want to make sure that they don't. Mm -hmm. I think there's there's tons of settings in Kentico <laughs> that are, are really valuable. Um, I think unless you have an explicit reason to store your files in the database, then I think making sure that you check to have them stored in the file system early on 
is definitely a good place to start. Okay. That, that's actually a really good one, and it's one that I've also often had um, that you'll find out much later when you, people decide to upload about a billion PDFs that you'll realize that your database is 20 gig, and that's, oh, because everything's stored in the database. So uh, that's an excellent tip. I think if you're going live, then there's, there's obviously a lot of settings that you want to change for live deployments, like making sure that you have all of the debugging off, and then there's definitely a good core set of SEO settings and performance settings that are very applicable for whenever you actually go live. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Roman, how about you? Uh, so I would also like to mention disable uh, continuous integration. Um, yeah, and check uh, check your uh, uh, hash salt in web config, especially if you uh, you are going to use staging. Um. Okay, Ex excellent ideas. Change, making sure your hash salt is correct. That will actually affect if you want to um, move information from one system to the other, from one environment to the other. Your hash salt becomes very important in that case. Um. Laura, how about you? What, what would be your one best recommendation or, or tip not to forget? Um, I think a, a lot of people uh, maybe don't don't really look at all of the um, the columns that they're pulling from the database, and it's important to remember to um, I guess with repeaters to only use the uh, only request the columns that you need to get the data from instead of pulling 140 unnecessary columns um, for your pages. And also, if you don't need to maintain um, uh, data across uh, postback or something, then don't forget to disable the view state. Excellent idea. And if you have trouble finding all of those columns or which repeaters you're not specifying columns, you can uh, go on GitHub. Download the K Inspector. It's a free open source tool that we have, and one of the one of the tests you can run in there will go through your entire site, tell you every repeater that you're not specifying columns, and that will have a significant impact on your database performance and scalability of the platform. So, it's on uh, it's on GitHub. Just search for K Inspector, and you'll find the entire project here that you can download. So. And just to chime in on that part a little bit, and that's if you are using Portal Engine or the mix mode, uh, because it's checking against the database. If you have a pure ASPX template, we're not able to check those repeaters. And also that the King Inspector uh, has a, a like a report for the settings uh, and configuration as well, uh, just to show you uh, some of the things that you can. Uh, you are not using, you may want to consider disable them uh, alongside with uh, some of the schedule tasks as well. Uh, they are always uh, kind of default schedule tasks, tasks being turned on, but if you are not using them, you can consider turning them off as well. Yeah, and one nice oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Say one nice thing about the K Inspector tool as well is that you know, if you grab it from GitHub, the way it's developed, you can create your own modules as well. So say you've got for a particular build or just in your company, when you develop your technical sites, you've got a specific group of settings that you want to check, then you can always write your module to check those settings for yourselves and run the test against that. Um, there's actually a follow-up question to this. It's actually for Laura, um, I believe, and it was, is it better to use media libraries to, or to upload those site images to the content tree? I think this goes back to your, you know, your main tip that you, you kind of recommended. Um, and just re maybe it's to everyone. I'll, I'll go and add it there. But they they told you specifically, Laura. So I guess they wanted you to answer. So okay, um, I I think it depends on what you're doing. Uh, really, I prefer to use uh, media libraries for site images. Um, but I think there's some um, uh, some cases where you would use the content tree, where um, maybe if you want to apply some permissions to the images or if you want to give them an alias. Um, those are the only times I would actually use the content tree, but I would always uh, prefer to use the media library. Yeah, I think functionally one of the, the big differences between the two of them here is that if you're going to use the out-of-the-box can't go smart search to search within document content, then those documents need to be part of the content tree. It won't parse the content in the media library, so you'll have to go and develop like a, a custom index yourself. But I think as of version, it's um, it's not a default functionality. Can't go can 
consume your document content and make that part of Smart Search. You just have to make those files in the content tree to buy into that. Excellent points. All right, uh, next question we have, moving on, this is going to be for uh, Michael and Roman. Have you tried to use Kentico 9 MVC with the content-only page types and handle more than one page alias? Is there any other way besides the IIS rewrite? This, this actually goes outside of my experience with M MVC, but I, I know that you, Michael, have had some experience with it, and I think you have too, Roman. If not, just make up an answer, and that will sound good. But um, <laughs> what are your two thoughts on this? Yeah, well, you've got, like, with any MVC site, you have full control over the reading logic with your own separate MVC5 site. So you can use that to hit a controller and then at the controller level grab the alias and go looking for content in there. Okay. Um, Roman, do you have any, anything to add to that? Um, unfortunately, no. I have no experience with this. So. Okay, that's cool. I, I figured that Michael probably had the most experience when it comes to MVC. Um, so. Uh, then I'm gonna I'm gonna send you another one, Roman, and it's uh we'll we'll put you on the spot for this one. Let me uh, let me just get it ready so I can paste it in my window, and that is going to be, can I share master pages between Portal Engine and ASPX pages without creating the pages as custom web parts? So, um, is that something you you've kind of dealt with before, Roman? Um, uh, I can remember. I, uh, I was dealing with this, uh, but it was um, some time before. Um, okay. I, I know that I've uh, really, this goes all the way back to when I did ASPX development primarily, and I started doing a lot of the, the mixed mode, meaning it was an ASPX page, but it included the portal template inside of it, uh, and it included the portal engine. Um, that's really how I would do something like that. Now, once I had that, ASPX template, I actually would use master pages, ASPX master pages with ASPX templates using the portal engine inside of it. Um, if you wanted to share your actual layout of your master page between um, your portal engine and your, let's say, your ASPX implementation, I don't really know of any way you can do that. You possibly could extract out each piece into its own portal engine area, like its own like web part zone and just have your ASPX master page be a very basic implementation of a master page. But I think you're going to, you're still going to end up replicating things inside of the Kentico master page and your ASPX master page at the same time. I don't really know of any way you're going to get around that. I think you can, you can make it lean and you could, you could get very little things, you know, to put in each side, but I think you're always still going to replicate some things like your head tags and, and different things like that. Unless anyone has any other ideas about that. I'm not really sure. Okay, uh, actually I have some um, some thoughts for this one. Uh, actually, I dealt with a couple of clients who requested this as well. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to create custom web parts for that. Um, but in, uh, so basically, uh, uh, kind of the original idea I, I provided somebody was uh, uh, for the components on the master page, such as your header and footers, you can create them as, you can create a page type, or you can call this page type your configuration. Uh, no page type, and then it was in there. You may have like a two uh, rich text area, uh, which you can uh, put in, uh, like say, you know, the, these uh, the, these components. Uh, but then, of course, uh, if you want to do dynamic components there in there, you have to rely on widget a little bit. Uh, but essentially, you can uh, put like say, you know, anything uh, text-based uh, in your navigation uh, footer header uh, into those uh, uh, fields of the the page type. And then within your, like say, ASPX uh, master page, you can use the repeater to call that uh, single configuration page and uh, use transformation to pass out uh, that field and then display that. Uh, or uh, later on, like, you know, recently I found out, oh, you can, you don't even need to use uh, uh, that. You can use uh, uh, kind of API to call that field directly, like uh, the document, uh, uh, you know, giving the path and then dot the, the, uh, the or the get field, or sorry, get value of that, like say the header field or the footer value field. And then in that case, uh, the the page uh, or sorry, on the master page itself, it's going to retrieve whatever you put into uh, those uh, uh, fields and display them on the master page. So in this case, you can actually uh, repurpose this uh, from both the portal engine side and the master page side, or sorry, like uh, ASPX side. 
uh, it, within the portal engine, again, you can uh, use a uh, uh, summer approach. You can use macro or you can use uh, transformation to retrieve those fields and then display them onto the master page. Uh, but essentially, you can manage uh, the header and folder or the glo global components uh, in like a one page type by using APIs or macro to, uh, to pull those data out into the master pages. Yeah, I, I think that that's an excellent that's an excellent answer, Ray. And I, I think it really just shows that, you know, often people ask and they've asked me over the years, what's the best way to do something? And I'm like, well, there's about 30 different ways to do it. it it's what's the best for you and how you develop and how you want to manage it. And so you can certainly accomplish things in a number of ways. You really kind of have to figure out what fits best into your development patterns and methodologies. And that's how you kind of get to know the best answers. Um, and get to understand what the best way to do something is. And it, unfortunately, that's going to be a different answer for everybody. But I think you, the best thing that people can do is just educate themselves on all the different ways. And, and when it comes to portal and engine and master pages and ASPX templates, there's certainly a lot of different ways to do that. So I, I recommend just kind of learning as much as you can about, about all the di different development patterns and the de development methodologies and inside the Kentico documentation we actually break it down if you want to do ASPX, if you want to do portal, if you want to do mixed, um, we kind of give you examples of each one of those and, and the pros and cons. I believe there's a pros and cons list of what one is good for and what the other one is good for. But really educating yourself on all that is probably the first step to, to finding out what the best way to go about it is. So um, the next question is um, looking for an option to allow us to sync changes from test into production, but would like to be able to select changes to be moved. We only want to, we only want approved changes to be moved at the same time. We want to make simple CMS changes directly in production. So um, this question is going to open up a, a huge can of worms because I think it, I think the question actually contradicts itself. Um, so I'll address that. And then I'd like to get, uh, I'd like, Ray, I'd like to get your kind of thoughts, but I'll, I'll kind of take a stab at it first. So um, okay. Whenever you sure. define a, a content migration or content publication process, the most successful ones are very defined, and you have a, you have one area that is used for one purpose and another one that's used for another purpose. And in the simplest implementation, let's say you have a staging server and you have your production server, and you define your content migration as everything goes into the staging server and then it flows into the production server. And if you can adhere to that very strict process, you're going to simplify your life because then you basically have a one-way synchronization of information from your staging server to production server. What complicates things is the last line of this is they want to make simple changes in the CMS directly. So when you do that, you now you've kind of gone to an unorthodox content migration and publication process. So with that, it's going to require some, some special considerations and configurations on your part. Namely, do you need these production changes to be back down in your QA environment? If so, then you may need to look into the bidirectional staging using the staging feed module of Kentico, which, um, but then it gets very iffy because then you can't do automatic synchronizations from your staging to production and, and, a, and a litany of other things. So I, I, I caution companies from implementing the bidirectional staging while it is very functional and it will accomplish some, some really interesting um, goals and, and allow you to do some very cool things. It comes at a cost, and it comes at um, with an understanding of how the staging module works. So, I would say definitely the staging model is how you're going to sync those changes, and that's I think that's probably one of the best and, and tried and true ways. But if you want to make those in production, you're going to have to use bidirectional staging, which is going to change your paradigm a good bit, and it's going to have to you're going to have to have some considerations on how you move content, and really you're going to need to really stress the adherence to some particular process so that people know exactly what to do. Um, so with that, Ray, what, what are your kind of thoughts on it? Okay, so here's the thing. A lot of times people uh, you know, just look into the synchronization and then they forgot another great function that's uh, out of box, which is the workflow. Uh, sometimes people, they don't set up any workflow, which allows them to save multiple time and then decide to publish the content that's ready to go. Uh, in this, in, in a lot of scenarios, I've seen that you no know, people simply don't have workflow. They only ha they have direct publishing on their staging and then direct publishing on their production. So they're they are using the staging uh, as their workflow. So they will you no know, publish the content or save and publish the content on staging, and then when they think it's ready to go, then they will sync over to production, which that uh, you know that's not the, always the, the best thing. So to the first part of this question, you know, if you only want to select changes to be moved when it's like kind of being ready on the staging, 
uh, then definitely set up staging over there. Um, so you know you can uh, set up approval process over there as well. Um, so basically any content that's uh, being created, uh, updated, if it hasn't been published on your staging, it's not going to generate a synchronization task. And then um, that task, or basically you will not be able to synchronize the unpublished version to the production site if it's not ready. Only the ones that's uh, being published on staging at that moment can be synchronized to production so you can see the latest change in production environment. And then in this case, uh, let's say you know, to the last sentence, you, know, you want to make changes in production. In that case, do you really need the staging? You know, uh, in some, some people, they, they, they just uh, they totally think about staging, uh, using staging between staging environment and production. They totally forgot that with workflow, you can do live content changes. Again, you are not really save and publish directly. You are saving changes and then um, publish that when it's ready or go through approval process for some uh, managers to approve the content and publish that. Um, so in that case, you don't really need to have another staging environment. And then you, your staging environment is maybe your like a testing environment, which are purely for like say development purposes, not really for your uh, content testing purposes. So again, yeah, to understand, do you need first? Do you need the two separate environments, staging and production? Uh, no. Can you do uh, workflow? Should uh, you definitely should do workflow. Uh, so that will avoid one thing, and then you need to consider. Or once you can understand uh, where can you do these things with workflow, and then uh, decide do you need the two you no know, separate environment just uh, to synchronize you know the published content from one to another. Again, in some client cases, they, they have to do this uh, behind the firewall on the staging environment because the authentic authentication or other uh, for other reasons, um, then they push to the production side. But in a lot of cases, if uh, changes can be made on the production side, use workflow to control uh, when to fire up something, then definitely you know, you know, avoid the extra uh, environment uh, you know, just to make things a little bit more complicated. Excellent. And I, another thing that may help you kind of with this particular question is that the, the previous technical webinar that I did was actually advanced content staging scenarios where I, I discussed a number of different things, but specifically, you know, custom staging, logging, workflow, you know, with synchronization, log change handling so that you can only synchronize specific areas of the content tree or synchronizing other objects other than image, other than just pages. Um, it's, there's actually a good bit of downloadable source code on that particular blog as well as the webinar that may help you. And uh, last thing I will say about this kind of particular thing, um, the continuous integration feature of Kensco 9 may help you if you're, if you're working, looking to move functionality from one to another. But another great piece, and this was just announced today, is uh, as part of our technology partnership, uh, one of our partners, BizStream, who Brian McKeever, who's an MVP for that, that particular company, um, they just released a new tool called Compare for Kentico, which allows you to compare two different uh, Kentico installations and see exactly what's different between them, even all the way down to the database level of which store procedures and views and, and what have you are different. So I highly recommend you, you kind of check that out. Look for on devnet.com. We're going to have some posts about it. So you'll, you'll be able to learn more about it in the coming weeks. But that's another tool that, that has just been released that, that may be able to aid you for that as well. So um, it's a good question, though. Uh, so the next question I have is going to be for uh, for Roman and uh, Laura and Michael, and that is when creating custom web parts, widgets, or controls, what's the main thing that makes you decide whether or not you're going to copy an existing Kentico one or start one from scratch? And so uh, Roman, I'd like to get your take on that if you if you have a a checklist in your mind of of how you decide that. Uh, so in my personal experience, <clears throat> it's really a rare case when you would need to copy the existing Canical report and make uh, changes to it. Uh, usually they should be uh, uh, enough flexible and there are some parameters that you can uh, kinda, uh, alter their uh, behavior uh, functionality. <clears throat> so the only, uh, the only thing uh, I could th think of is uh, uh, layout. Sometimes uh, Kenko has uh, the Kenko reports has like table layout, which uh, does not work in every case in every scenario. And in these cases, we can uh, just create new layout for the report. So one report could have multiple layouts. This uh, this is the feature I've used uh, uh, for a couple of times, and it works really well for me. Um, okay. Um, how about you, Laura? Do you have a, Do you have any particular 
you know, decisions that you make when you decide whether or not you're going to copy an existing one or start from scratch? Uh, yeah, sure. I like to clone them whenever a lot of the functionality is already built into the web part. That way um, you're already following some of the best practices that Kentico has laid out for how um, things need to be developed, like repeaters and things like that. But if you have some, um, your customizations are um, are very different than from what the web part is, then it's it's useful to just start from scratch and maybe just copy a, a few of the things from the from the Kentigo web part code, um, so that you're you're doing it in a way that kind of fits with the system overall. Okay, and how about you, Michael? Yeah, no, I agree with Laura. Um, like, I, if you see that there's a web part from Kentigo that does about 90% of what you're looking for, um, then maybe that's a determination to clone that and then to, to add in your customizations there. Never customize a web part or component from Kentigo directly. Uh, if you do that approach, if you take a web part from Kentigo and you clone it and you customize it, just be aware that when you go through upgrades that Kentigo obviously we'll be upgrading and making changes to the original web part. You might want to check that out just to see what the differences are, to see if there's any new things that they've added in. But yeah, I think it really comes down to what you're what you're looking to do. If there's a if Kentigo can get you eighty percent there, then maybe you clone from there and add in. Otherwise just you know create a new one from scratch. Excellent. All right. Uh, next question. This is going to be a little bit interesting. What are some of the best tips for SEO when using Kentico? So I'd like to get everyone's kind of take on this. Like what is your top one SEO tip and whoever answers first may take the easiest one so I'll let um I will let Laura ladies first she gets the first crack at the best SEO tip for using Kentico. Why well, I don't know what the best would be but I would say don't forget to uh, add the metadata to the pages and the and the properties tab. That's a that's a great tip actually. It's one a lot of developers, uh, myself included, maybe in the past have often forgotten to do. So that's a great idea. Um, how about you, Michael? Um, something that I've seen a few times is just make sure that you know your site and your content can be successfully crawled. So make sure you check your Google Sitemap XML file. Make sure that you know the content that you want to be put in there. Uh, has been actually added in, so you might need to take the Google web part and add in your custom page types to make sure that they're output. Because crawlers will hit your site, they'll find links, but if you've got a very dynamic front end, you know, you may not actually have your content appearing on first load. So you want to combo up good quality markup with links and also a sitemap XML file that's going to make, you know, give you a 360 for crawlers. Excellent. That's a good point. Uh, Ray, how about you? I thought I, I'm going last, but uh, okay. Uh, actually, I have a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, uh, you know, things that I learned from uh, others as well. Uh, you know, make sure your website have enough content to be crowd. Uh, I mean, nowadays everything, every website is like a large panel of uh, graphics, a little bit of text. That doesn't get you anywhere. You need to have enough text in there to, in order for the the, the crawlers. To, uh, to find those information and also rank your content to be relevant to something. Otherwise, it's like if it's just blocks of images, it's not useful for any SEO purpose at all. Uh, and then the second thing is uh, uh, make sure you check the search report or, or in the analytics. Uh, I know that the, you know, Google, they don't you know, give us the, the search keyword people use over there, but we have the built-in search. Uh, report, which uh, you can still find out some of the information people are searching on your uh, within the site itself. So, uh, you know, this is a, sometimes a, a missed uh, a part of the whole SEO talk. You know, everything is about oh, adding this, adding that, but your content itself. You know, try to identify those keywords people are searching for, and then ask your uh, copywriters to uh, write your content better to target those keywords. Um, so again, you know, nowadays the, the the content is the king of uh, SEO. If you, I mean, especially when it's based on SE, or like uh, uh, relevancy scores, if you don't have uh, the, the correct uh, amount of, or if you don't have enough uh, repeat of the same keywords you're targeting, then you know, your relevancy score would be pretty low. So again, yeah, write the, uh, the content better based on the, the search report. Okay, excellent idea. Uh, Roman, do you have any tips or one, one great SEO tip that hasn't already been talked about? 
Uh, so actually, I can talk about uh, there are some uh, some other settings in uh, URL and CO sections that you have to check, which is redirect needs alias to main URL or allow permanent redirection. Uh, do you have to make sure you uh, you have at least default replacement page when you are uh, deleting some pages from your site, or specify uh, some URL for each uh, for each page separately when you are removing it as well as moving view state uh, to the end of the page. Um, also, like uh, Michael already mentioned, you have to make sure you have a uh, correct uh, HTML structure, you have a nice page lot, you don't have uh, JavaScript errors on your page, um, you have your site structure, uh, site map uh, set up correctly and and logically, as well as I would like to add that uh, right now a schema that org is quite popular to help uh, uh, search crawlers to um, uh, go through your site and figure out what is where. And it works pretty well with Kenico templating and Kenico transformation. I use it for a couple of times, and it worked well. Okay. Um... And uh, I would say all those are, are great configurations, and so my, my take would be if you want to improve your SEO, have often changing relevant content to your, to your audience. That is the best way to improve your SEO. You have to update your content regularly, and it has to be relevant, and that's probably the, the tried and true way of include, you know, increasing your SEO is make sure you have have good information that you're providing people and you're updating on a daily basis, not maybe on a daily or weekly or whatever, you know, whatever it is you can do. I think that all those will help improve your SEO. So um, we have one, uh, we have just a couple uh, time for just a few more questions. And uh, so the one I'm going to do very quickly is going to be, uh, uh, Ray, what is your biggest hurdle or pain point when upgrading to version nine? Uh, that was, that was a question that we had that, um, I just want to get one quick take on it if, if you had a response to it. Okay, uh, so the uh, so upgrade from 8 to 8.2 to 9 is actually much simpler than upgrade from 7 to 8 uh, because the, back then that's where all the major APIs are, are uh, changed. Uh, so between 8 and 9, oh sorry, 8.2 and 9, uh, the upgrade is uh, fairly simple and straightforward. Um, so you don't have to uh, you know, worry too much and again we have those uh, tools which helps you on the API upgrade side. Uh, the only thing that I would say to watch out for is uh, in version 9 we actually uh, start to shrink uh, kind of the the, the footprint of the whole CMS platform so we are taking out some of those uh, 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 web parts because by default we have like uh, I think over 400 web parts and some of those uh, like uh, web parts that's not being used often are being taken out of the, uh, you know, the, the latest version so uh, if you are doing a brand new installation, you may not find those uh, web parts. But when you are doing an upgrade, uh, by default, those web parts will, will be kind of, uh, or the registration of those web parts will be removed. Uh, you may still have the code file, but it's not going to be available in the CMS. Uh, there is a, a knowledge-based article on how you can, because we do support backward compatible, so you uh, you can basically, uh, I think, run a file to uh, import those uh, registration back into CMS. So when you, like say, you know, during the, uh, so you can still use uh, some of those uh, web parts which we no longer officially support as out of box, uh, and but definitely think about uh, moving them into something else as well, uh, because again, some of the web parts may uh, was a little bit too much for us to maintain, and also you know maintain 400 of them in the CMS. Uh, the, the the compiling time will take longer as well. So excellent. Uh, so just watch out for that. Excellent. Good. Good tip. Thank you, Ray. And uh, with that, we're going to have time for one last question, and I, I saved one of the probably most discussion-worthy questions for the end, and uh, so it's going to be open to everybody. Um, but it's actually a two-part. You're not aware of the first part yet, but the first part is going to be, first, are you Team Iron Man or are you Team America? One word, <laughs> everybody, Laura, Iron Man or Captain America? Iron Man all the way. Okay. Michael? Iron Man, because he has Spider-Man. Oh, there you go. Roman? Maybe Batman. <laughs> All right, uh, Brad. Know, yeah. And I don't know. <laughs> All right. I, I would probably have to say uh, Captain America um, only because I, I love the American flag, so I'll just say that. So um, anyway, so the next question is, this was kind of interesting. Do the panelists feel with 
but obviously .NET's moved toward MVC, especially with .NET 5, which won't feature web forms, as if you didn't know that, welcome to the real world where everyone knows that. And, uh, and do we do you think that Kentico will have to, you know, obviously we'll have to make the leap and embrace MVC fully, and do you think that that's going to be restructuring the entire Kentico platform and moving away from web forms? And is that exciting to you? Is that worrisome to you? What, what are your kind of thoughts on that? Um, and I will go with uh, Roman first on this particular topic. Oh, yeah. I, I'm excited at this moment. I, uh, my personal opinion is that web forms will be uh, history in a couple of years. So nowadays everyone moving uh, from that platform to uh, uh, any other. So web forms is uh, like they are too heavy. Uh, you know, every every click is like post back full reload of the page. It's not uh, like uh, web works nowadays. Right now we have lightweight technologies like web API and we see so we are doing AJAX calls getting only exclusively that piece of data we need. You don't need to reload the entire layout, rebuild it. So yeah, I'm excited about this and uh, I'm looking forward to do more and more work with MVC and like I mentioned with Web API. So to make user experience uh, much more smooth, you know, uh, much faster pages should be much more responsive. With those kind of technologies you can build single page applications or like I, I like to call it client applications where you load it once and then you are just working uh, similar to uh, just Windows application. Excellent, okay. Uh, Ray, what are your thoughts on this particular topic? Hmm. Actually, I think uh, many of you may be in the same shoe as me. Uh, I'm not like a pure uh, hardcore uh, .NET developer, so for me there's no so much things like oh I have to use uh, .NET for that or sorry use a uh, form uh, web form for that um, so with uh, moving toward MVC I think it's uh, it's it's uh, just like something new for me to learn or to learn comfortable uh, again the comfortable level has to be at a certain point in order to just uh, start doing everything with that uh, so it's going to be a learning curve um, but uh, definitely I would say you know, this is the part where I think uh, you know, doing things in portal may help versus if you are just doing everything uh, as uh, like uh, you know, in Visual Studio uh, because I think uh, as part of the plan, Kinnico is going to uh, create some of those modules, uh, you know, like uh, things like a drag and drop uh, with MVC support as well. So later on, you can essentially do those things directly with uh, kind of what you're doing with Auto Engine without actually going to Visual Studio to create those things. So that's why you know jump on the bandwagon and learn Portal Engine, uh, you know, and uh, ditch the <laughs> the pure ASPX. Uh, you know, that will make the whole transaction a little bit smoother uh, than the others. Gotcha, uh, Laura. How about you? What are your thoughts? Um, I think that Kentico uh, built a really great uh, plat platform on um, uh, using web forms and I I would just be very curious to see how they how they how things are um, changed for MVC. I mean, from from your perspective, are you excited about the shift to MVC, and is it is it one that you're looking forward to as a developer? I don't know if excited will be the right term. More more curious than anything. Okay. Uh, how about you, Michael? Um, yeah, I think it's great. I think they have taken a smart strategy to be able to move earlier. Um, so rather than having to flip everything to MVC from the get-go, taking the approach of, of almost being like a headless CMS at this point, where you can develop your site entirely in MVC5 using whatever processes and structure makes sense for you, and then reach out to Kentigo for content. And Kentigo can remain and has remained um, a web forms application, which means Kentigo can then flip the admin side to MVC whenever it makes sense for, for them. So I think I think it's a the approach that they've taken is smart. If you look at the roadmap, um, it's great to see that they're they're putting so much effort into making the API accessible from MVC with e-commerce, EMS, and other features like that coming in. So I think it's a really exciting time. Okay, uh, that's actually a good point, and I, and I can speak to that. And as part of the product management team within Kentico, um, you know, Kentico strives to be agnostic as possible for basically meaning. We want developers and companies to implement Kentico however it fits in best with their development patterns and methodologies. They can host it on Azure or Amazon or their in, 
on premise, wherever they want to host it. And we want to continue to expand the platform so that you can develop it using the, the, the libraries and the frameworks that work best with your organization. And to do that, we're really kind of moving to, again, as you kind of said, it's all about the API and it's really about exposing information and functionality via an, a programming interface that then someone could then include within their MVC site or PHP or whatever it is they want to include it into. So I think you're going to see a more and more shift to that as we have more and more functionality available to that particular type of development pattern. And um, on a personal level, I've done web forms for a very long time. So it is a, it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge for me to shift to MVC. I'm, I'm trying to get better. I've written a, a couple apps, but I definitely have a long ways to go. But it's a, like anything else with technology, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens, and I'm interested to see where, where the market goes. And, uh, you know, I just try to hold on and, and learn the new things just like everybody else does. So it doesn't matter. Whatever changes today will be something different tomorrow. So we'll just start it all again. Um, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. It's just a different day. We just do the same thing again and again with a new technology. So um, I, I'm excited for it, and I am, I'm very excited of how Kentco is morphing, like you said, Michael, and, and how we've kind of taken the stance of we really want to build the foundation that you can use Kentco how you want to use it, and we're going to continue to build out that space to make it even more applicable to, to different you know, OSs and whatever you have. So um, I'm excited to see where that goes as well. So... Uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. We're, we're just about up on our time, so I want to go ahead and uh, wrap things up. Uh, I definitely wanted to thank all of our, our panelists. Um, if you did not know, Laura, Michael, and Roman are all part of our Kentico MVP program. They've all done a tremendous amount for the, in, for the community. Uh, they blog, uh, they make videos, they post on DevNet, so they're part of our uh, MVP program because of how much they're committed to Kentico and how much they're committed to to making the community better. Um, and I wanted to thank Ray, he's, he's part of our consulting team. So if you're not familiar with them, they, they, can, they can help you kind of get over some very difficult hurdles with your projects. And uh, our consultants are very knowledgeable. They have years of experience working with Kentico and they have a lot of different kind of unique experience because often they get brought in to see, okay, something's not running well on our site. So their knowledge is very good in regards to what's wrong with my implementation because they've seen a lot of bad implementations. So um, Ray, along with the rest of our consultants, are very knowledgeable when it comes to performance, scalability, and really fine-tuning and making sure that your site is set up for success as much as possible. So again, I'll remind you that the webinar has been recorded and we'll post it to the YouTube channel. And you can find all of the Kentico webinars on YouTube. Just search for Kentico on YouTube and you'll find all of our technical webinars over the over the many years, as well as our Kentico 9 videos and, and other things. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us on DevNet or support at Kentico.com or myself at Barnes at Kentico.com. And uh, I'll be glad to address any questions that you have. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their time. And uh, I hope you have a great day.